Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is fantastic, this. I'm quite, I'm quite happy with this. Can I like clip it onto myself as well? Oh, this is amazing. Yours do we want? I might take it with me. <laughs> My son would love this. A nice little point. Um, how are we all doing? I'm good. You're not at the public speaking uh, event? <laughs> Uh, no, inshallah. Um, I, I, I had to think about what I wanted to do today. And, uh, you know, I've been given the, the topic Islamic Finance 101. And I've given a few of these talks. And, you know, I'm a human being. And, and I get bored giving the same talk. So I thought, how can I kind of stay in the remit of Islamic Finance 101? And obviously, I can't, you know, I can't come up with something completely new. Otherwise, you know, that will be outside the remit of Islam. Um, but at the same time, I want to do something new. And, and I thought a good way of structuring today's talk is firstly starting with a story and thinking about the link between that and Islamic finance and finance generally. And it's a story of Suleiman. And then secondly, just whizzing through really quickly uh, the various different stages of a person's life and how finance money, Islamic finance has a role to play. And why should you guys care? I mean, what's you know, what's the point of this whole lecture? What's the point of me being here? What's the point of you guys, you know, spending your time listening to me? And then finally we'll have some question and answers and there's a few FAQs that we can go into. But it got me thinking this uh, is there like a way of clicking backwards and forwards on this? Uh, I can go yeah, like this, right? Uh -huh. So there was a verse in here that got me thinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu kunu min tayyibati ma razaqnakum wa shkuru lillahi in kuntum iyyahu ta'budun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I've given you stuff. There's really pure, nice stuff that I've given you. So that, that's one lesson that we've already taken. So of the stuff, we should take the good stuff. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to us as risk. Razaknakum, I've given it to you. He, he associates that risk with him. And then washkuru lillah. So, you know, for those of you who do maths, I think Abdurrahman, uh, you do maths, you'll regret telling me your name, um, <laughs> and computer science. And you know, you've got the uh, if then relationships. Yeah. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, washkuru lillah, for you to be grateful to Allah. So that's, you know, that's the point of all of this, right? And the story that I started thinking about was a story of, and this is a really important theme throughout Islam and throughout the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says uh, in, uh, in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, when, you know, the jinn, uh, they were in front of him and they were competing uh, for Sulaiman alayhi salam's, um, you know, happiness. And Sulaiman said that, who can bring me the throne of the Queen of Sheba? And one of them said that, you know, I'll bring it to you, uh, you know, I'll bring it to you within a day. Um, and then another one said that I will bring it to you within the blink of an eye. And, uh, and then the Quran goes on, he says, and then the very next verse goes, As soon as that guy had said it, he'd done it, and it was there. That was how quick it was. Like, we're not talking, BT super fast bro you know, broadband, we are talking quicker than that and we're talking not just you know, a Netflix movie, we're talking a throne had appeared in front of Sulaiman and, uh, and what was his response to that? This is the fascinating thing. Uh, this is from the mercy and the bounties of my Lord. To test me. Liabluani Ashkuruam Akfur. Uh Akfuram Ashkur. What's what's the verse? The Hafid? Um where's he gone? Oh what a disaster. Uh Liabluani Ashkuruam Akfur. So should I I'm being tested whether or not I do one of two things. Should am I going to do kufr or I am I going to do shukr? So there's two counterpoints to this relationship of shukr and kufr. And you know, often we think, okay, so kufr is like disbelief, you know, um, whatever. And the opposite of that is being a Muslim. But no, the opposite of that in the Quran is 
being thankful, to have shukr. Now this is the bit where, you know, I'm kind of thinking about this myself. What has Islamic finance and what has, you know, our mu'amalat, our transactions, our business affairs got to do with shukr? Because really, if you boil it all down, that's the point of this, this discussion, right? The point of this discussion is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't be a kafir, be a shakir. So how are we going to be a shakir? How's finance got to do with that? Any ideas? I mean, it's, it's not really a you know, trick question. Any ideas? Shukr, thankfulness, finance, money. Thoughts? As in if the money that you gain is a pain, and you're uh, sticking to that and saying, well, money, you can work for that. Yeah, agree 100%. Uh, is anyone married in this room? Okay, good. You don't have to own up if you know if you are. Uh, you've got presumably lots of you've got parents, right? And when you're thanking your parents, let's say your mom says to you, uh, it does something really nice for you, and then you thank her by buying her an Xbox. Uh, in my experience, most moms do not like Xboxes, right? So if you buy her an Xbox. Are you really thanking her in the way that she wants to be thanked? Possibly not. Uh, and so, you know, that's a really important point, right? So we have to thank in the way that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to. Any other ideas? <coughs> Any other ideas? Shukr. Just being grateful for any wealth you have been given, um, and being content with it. As an example, of being grateful. Yeah, hundred percent. 100%. And, and then now, I want you to think about, um, okay, so you've got that wealth, you're going to thank Allah SWT in the right way by using it in the right way, you're being thankful to Allah SWT, which is the obvious answer, by being thankful to Him, thank you Allah SWT for giving me uh, a Lamborghini, whatever, uh, I don't have a Lamborghini, don't worry. Uh, today I bought myself a Toyota Prius uh, for, I won't disclose the price, uh, but it's less than £7,000. I know, I splashed out, I splashed out. Uh, my car got stolen from the front of the house. This is a massive tangent, but my car got stolen from the front of the house because someone broke into the screwdriver. So if any of you are really strapped for cash, then get yourself a screwdriver. It's quite an easy way of making some money. Um, but anyway, back, back on track. So uh, we, we want to, we've got this money, and the, the, the really important thing, we've got the, the basic thankfulness, and we've got the doing it in the right way, what else can we do with that money that's going to then really set us apart? What's going to take us from being just a Muslim, an ordinary bloke, to a mu'min or a muhsin, someone who you know, achieves the best? How are we going to do that? <coughs> Was there a hand there? Yeah? Interesting, what's your name? Minika. Minika. Milika. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's hold that thought. That's interesting. So you said that you use it in a way that uh, gives you everlasting uh, success. That's, I like that intuition. And then you went on and said, for example, by giving it to charity. I'm less keen on that intuition. Uh, not that it's wrong, I think it's part of the solution. But talk to me about that. Okay, so you want everlasting success. And, and that means, you know, what you did, Malika, there was you try to maximize, right? You didn't try to settle. Because there's lots of things in the world that are good that you can do with your money, right? But there's only a few things that you can do that are really efficiently, you know, trying to eke out the maximum reward that you can, the maximum return that you can get for your money um, and all your time. So let, any other ideas? How do we do that? So there's charity, there's what? Okay, go on. Like for example, have a think. Have a think. For example, what you're doing, and you're giving a talk in Islamic finance. Yeah. Opens people's eyes up. Other people can do the same. Okay. So, for example, the first investment schemes you can explain to people halal options, investing halal options with bank houses. Yeah. Other people can go through what groups of Yeah. Okay. So, um, so some kind of Islamic finance, well, it's called islamicfinanceguru.com, uh, 
but so some kind of Islamic finance, um, you know, information portal type thing. Any other ideas? You know, is is there stuff that's wrong in the world that needs to be sorted out? The world's perfect, right? Go on. Any ideas? Anything that is there? Anything wrong with the world right now? Pick one. Pick a, you know. Pick something that's on on everyone's agenda right now. Elections, <laughs> Elections right? Something wrong with the world. So uh, Malika there has got five hundred pounds. <coughs> Malik, what are you gonna do with that five hundred pounds now that you know that there's something on pressing on people's you know minds? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, it's like finance. Finance is an English word, but you know what we're talking about really is our resources. What Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us in risk, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us both money and ourselves. Right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He has made a transaction. This is a trans. What we're talking about here is how to maximize in a transaction. And what is that transaction? That transaction is in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He says. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought from the Muslims, mu'mineen, uh, He has bought themselves and their wealth, and for them there is Jannah. So in this particular case, it's talking about jihad and fighting and striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَى تِجَارَةٍ تُنْجِيكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ O you who believe, should I guide you to a transaction that will save you from the hellfire? تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَتُجَاهِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So he says, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and again strive in his way. So this is a transaction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is framing this in the Quran as a transaction. And so what we're talking about here is how best to maximize that transaction because when you when you're negotiating in a transaction you want to get the best re reward for it you want to get the best return for it and uh, and the point I'm making here is it's not just charity right when we think Muslims we think money we immediately go to charity that's not necessarily the best way because let's have a think about um, you know money generally Let's, yeah, let's use this. So you've got, you know, you've got pools of money that people have. Money, this is money in pockets. <coughs> and, you know, you deploy it to a charity. And a charity, really what it is, it's an engine in which you put fuel and it produces something as an as a output, right? So it gives that charity via, you know, some kind of, uh, it could be a school, it could be an institution, it could be a well, or it could be directly to the person themselves. But ultimately, it's going back to money in pockets. That's what's happening. A charity, what it's doing is just deploying money in a particular way and focusing on a particular set of people. Now, that money, ultimately, you know, you want to create... Uh, a better world, right? You want to solve problems. You want to maximize that transaction that you're engaging in. And so, you could think about other alternatives instead of charity. You could think about investing, right? Or you could think about buying um, assets, like uh, you could buy yourself a handbag, for example. Uh, I haven't bought myself a handbag recently, but um, you know, my wife often does that. Um, and so, you, you're putting your money into something. And ultimately, all of these things, where are they going? They're going back to here, right? And so what we're really talking about here is what is the journey of that money that you're going to be um, choosing as the most efficient and impactful thing that is going to bring you the most reward. And that isn't always charity. In fact, I would argue in the UK today, 
where 99% of money that you would give to a charity will go abroad, um, and you know the the uh, the efficient way of usage of that charity, you know, it's it's unclear, and the long-term impact of how that money is being used, to to my best of knowledge, is is not as well thought out as it could be. Um, I would say that you know maybe charity isn't the best way to deploy cash, but then you know you need to then think about what is the best way, right? Uh, so so for me, in my head, given where I am situated, and this is where you know Zane, you wanted me to talk a little bit about my background. So I did PPA at Oxford, then I did my masters in Islamic banking and finance from Markfield. At the same time, I was studying my um, uh, my island course, um, and then I carried on with Sheikh Akram Nadwi. Um, and I finished that off. I started Islamic Finance Guru. Um, I set up a company at university and carried on for a bit called designmoldme.com. Uh, uh, so like, you know, smile at Sunnah and stuff. Uh, those t-shirts, you might have seen them around. So that was us. Um, and so, and then I qualified as a lawyer. Um, I went to uh, Ashurst, I trained there, and then I left and went to Debevoice. So I'm a funds formation lawyer there. Uh, I work in forming private equity venture capital funds. Um, and uh, negotiating with investors when they're setting that up. So that's kind of you know a potted history of my life. Now, given that context and given that background, um, what made sense for me in particular was you know where am I going to put my money and my assets uh, and my time? For me, that looked like we as Muslims need to we need um, to have some kind of place that provides Muslims with an easy way of deploying um, assets in a halal way, guiding people to doing that in a halal way. But secondly, we also need to support Muslim entrepreneurship because that's the thing that's really going to move the needle. Because the Muslim woman is struggling, this, you know, Muslim, Muslims are 20% poorer than the rest of the world. How are we going to change that really quickly? Well, what are the ways that other people globally have changed really quickly? Well, that's mainly do, uh, using tech entrepreneurship. So, you know, seven of the world's uh, 14 hundred billion dollar companies are based in Silicon Valley. And that's only come about in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, South Korea had a massive burst of progress. And that was because they invested in technology. China is the same. It's having an absolute uh, you know, exponential boom right now because of uh, the inf investment in technology. Uh, Tel Aviv is a massive hub for technology as well. And, um, you know, these are the places that have grown massively over the last 20, 30 years. So for me thinking, okay, I work in funds formation. I've got a whole lot of friends who work at startups who've done decent startups. Um, and, uh, you know, I run a site finance guru. The obvious thing to do is to really focus in on that and to take that to the next level. So that's, that's my story. That's my answer, given my context and my, you know, uh, you know resources. Um, that this is what makes sense for me most to try and eke out the most I can out of this transaction between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that ultimately is a way of saying thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right so none of that was actually what I was going to talk about um, um, let me you know I feel like I should give you like a basic primer of Islamic finance just so that you know you leave here with a basic understanding of Islamic finance. And I'm apologies for people who might have heard this before. Uh, so, um, high level, actually I might pick on you guys. High level, what are the kind of two things that underpin Islamic finance? What are the two kind of, um, you know, ideas that we're trying to achieve? I'm looking at you, Zayn. Uh, fairness, equality in trade, honest trade. Okay, what, was, what did you say, the first thing? Fairness. Fairness, okay. Justice, let's put it as justice, uh, fighting inequality. And then the other thing was you said fairness in? Trade. Trade, okay, so let's uh, characterize that as uh, avoiding uncertainty, getting rid of uncertainty. Um, so now this is, this is me moving gears from you know, really thinking high level about what was going on to now getting to the nitty gritty of it. So that you know, if there's one kind of five minute segment that you remember from this talk, about what Islamic finance actually really is, then it's this. So uncertainty and injustice are at the roots of what Islam wants to avoid with everything that it talks about when it talks about Islamic finance. And there are a few key prohibitions that underpin Islamic finance. Uh, anyone, you know, give me the obvious one. Interest. Interest. 
You're not allowed to take interest. You're not allowed to take riba. Any others, what are you not also not allowed to do or take? Uh, ghara, right? Uncertainty, right? Uh, any others? Do I define uncertainty? I'll, I'll go into it. Uh, and uh, what? Any others? <coughs> Gambling. Gambling, massive. So there we are. We have three uh, key things that we don't like: uh, riba, ghara, and massive. And so, with with the riba. Why, why do we, at heart, why do we not like riba? So high level we've said there's two things, right? We've said that injustice is something we don't like and uncertainty is something we don't like. So why do we not like riba? Injustice. Injustice. Okay, tell me the story. Tell me the story of, of injustice. <coughs> Okay, how? Poor people need money. Okay. So they get to the rich people who have money. Okay. It's not like a rich man's being asked for money from the poor person. Right. So it's exploiting lack of wealth. They play in society. But then, uh, ultimately, are we, are we saying that we want a communist society? Okay. It's opportunistic. So it's using the fact that they're desperate to make more money than they originally did. Okay. But then, you know, so let's say you've got a doctor, right, who's taken out a mortgage. And he's otherwise renting. He's going to lose a ton of money renting. But he's now got a nice mortgage, probably paying less money per month. And uh, ultimately, he ends up making a decent return over 20 years over his, on his property. And the bank bank gets some money. The bank's happy, and the uh, you know the doctor's happy. What's what's unjust about that? What what is unjust about that? Talk to me. Has it got to do with the principle that if it's applicable there, it might be applicable in daily dealings with? Yeah, and go on. That could be poor and aren't in, the, uh, in a situation where they can defend themselves. So in this instance, the doctor might not come out of it worse off. However, if you then translate that injustice, I don't know if there's a facet of it where it has to be applicable to everyone yeah. in, in a broad sense. So if you then take that principle and you apply it to other situations, it can't translate completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. So I think there's, there's, two, there's two points to draw out there. One is that you've got um, uh, the point that uh, this is a particular instance of a wider system, right? And just an exception will never prove the rule, right? So I've just pulled out an exception, and you can't just say then, therefore that is it. But then by the same token, you can't pull out someone who got absolutely screwed over by Wonga and say <laughs> that he is, you know, my answer to why interest is haram. Because someone will always just turn around and say, look at Dr. Shopwick, who's, uh, you know, smashing it with his property in... Um, Ealing. Ealing is a nice area. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this is a systemic issue, right? And we mustn't forget that. Because what was it that caused the doctor to need to get a mortgage from the bank in the first place? Because house prices have gone like this uh, for the last few decades. And this all goes back to the nature of money and uh, our money supply. And without going into too much detail, something you should look up is a, a website called positivemoney.org. They've done some really good research into the nature of money and how it originated uh, and where it all comes from. Uh, but in a nutshell, our money is essentially popped into ex existence. 97% of it is popped into existence by banks when they're issuing debt. So banks do not normally, do not work as we think they work, which is we put money into them, they use that money to lend out to people, and they make a bit of return, and then they give that back to us. That's not how banks work. Banks use the money that we give to them as kind of risk capital that sits there. And it acts as a ratio to uh, how much they are going to lend out. But ultimately, the money that they're creating is literally just popped into existence. Um, and at the end of the day, they will settle up with all the other banks 
and it's not going to be very much that they need to settle up with because there's so many different transactions going either way, it all kind of cancels out. And so our money supply is in the hands of the banks. And the way that banks create this money is by issuing debt. And so um, you know, the more debt you have in the economy, the more money that you have, and the more debt that there is, you need to pay that back using more money than there is in the economy right now. And so that kind of creates this kind of spiral. And uh, wherever, uh, you know, and what, what is the main reason why many of us will take out a massive amount of debt? A house, right? And so uh, the more you see banks lending, the more you see house prices going up. And so there's an interesting relationship going on here. And that kind of gets to the point of uh, you know, what I'm getting at, which is that there's a systemic issue here uh, that, that is at play. So this interest thing is not just, you know, an inst you look, just look at an instance and think this is it. You have to understand it in the wider spectrum as well. Uh, and there's two kinds of interest, but I don't want to go in too much into the, you know, too much into the technicalities of it. Uh, the, I think the simple understanding of what you have as interest is probably a good one, which is, you know, if you lend from a bank and you have to give more money back, that's an issue. If there's no asset involved, you're not buying and selling an asset, there's usually going to be some kind of interest involved there. Uh, then we've got gharar. Why do we not like gharar? Gharar is uncertainty. So it's not like uncertainty, like, uh, you know, if I um, buy a car, for example, I uh, paid over my money yesterday evening, and there was a degree of uncertainty there, whether or not I would get that delivery today, uh, but I was willing to take that risk, right? There was some uncertainty, but it was, you know, there was a cap to it. Uh, what kind of uncertainty does Islam not like? Any ideas? Gambling. Okay, so let's park that. We'll go to gambling. Uh, but that's a kind of... Islam um, frames that in a slightly different way. Islam thinks of it as a... We'll go into that. Any ideas? What kind of uncertainty do we not like? Any ideas? Wait, there's a lot of the risk involved. Okay, yeah, go on. Any ideas? Like what kind of? Um, not sure exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's a tough one, and a lot of people have thought about how to kind of characterize what is halal risk versus what is haram risk. And I suppose the the easiest like in a way to think about it is give a few examples so you know you're not allowed to sell things that you don't have for example that's a key ro rule in in uh, in islam it's a hadith la tabi' ma laysa inda don't sell that which you don't have that would be a classic example of trying to avoid uncertainty and the reason the, the reason behind it is that you know at least i knew our man you know the turkish dude i bought the car from he had the car because I saw him, he had the car. So I, I knew that he, at least he had qabd over it, he had possession over it, and he could you know, make a delivery to me. But if some guy came to me and said, look, I'm going to get you a Toyota Prius, I'm going to sell you a Toyota Prius, and I'm like, where is your Toyota Prius? And he's like, oh, uh, I've not bought it yet. And then if I have a transaction with him, then there is a lot more uncertainty and it's reliant on another transaction that's going on, yeah? Um, are you allowed to sell the right uh, good question. This is a, a, another area where uh, the uncertainty element would kick in. Uh, the, I mean, to be honest, I need to refresh my um, reading on options. Uh, the standard view is they're not allowed, uh, but you know, you don't necessarily always have to follow the standard view if you uh, if you can sincerely and accurately come up with. Uh, you know, a countervailing position. Uh, Professor Hashim Kamali uh, is an academic who's written extensively on forwards, futures, and options. Really good um, reading for anyone who's really interested in this subject. Uh, but, you know, let me give you the conventional view. The conventional view is that an option is not necessarily something that you can buy and sell. Derivatives, the thing that, you know, you're not, you're not buying and selling a thing, you're buying and selling a right to a thing or a derivative thing from a thing. Uh, a derivative um, yeah, thing from a thing uh, so let's say you've got a stock right, so that's a share in a company but instead of buying the stock 
you're buying a derivative, which is this piece of paper, this financial instrument, which is a promise between this spread betting company and you that if the share goes up, they will pay you out more. And if the share goes down, they will pay you out less. So you don't actually own the share. You are, you are just transacting. You are essentially buying and selling uh, chance, right? And, and that would be very uns uncertain. There's nothing certain to that under, you know, there's not, no asset underlying that transaction. And there's, you know, there's a lot we can say about this because um, all of these principles come from a very, uh, you know, very well considered place. Because, you know, we talk about the financial crisis, what caused the financial crisis? Sorry, I did this at LSE and everyone was like, yes, we know this answer. Uh, they were absolutely loving it. Subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages, Allahu Akbar. Uh, and you're a medic as well, right? <laughs> it's fantastic. UCL have, uh, have embarrassed LSE. Um, <laughs> So, subprime mortgages were caused by derivatives. And so Islam, all of these things that we're talking about, there is actually a reason for that. And I'm not gonna go on through the story of the global financial crisis here, but look it up, that's the basis. And then finally, this brings us on to Maesir and gambling. So Maesir, the reason why we don't like Maesir is because it's a zero sum game, right? If you are betting on a horse, winning a race, then either you are going to win or the betting company is going to win and someone is going to lose that money entirely. Whereas normally in a transaction, let's say I buy a, a hat of someone, that person will walk away from that transaction quite happy because they have got some money out of it. I will walk away happy because I've got a hat out of it. And so we're both happy. Whereas in a betting situation, if you bet on a horse and it's lost, then you're probably not gonna be very happy that you've you know, spent 10 pounds or whatever it is uh, and lost that money. There's no way that you will be happy because of that. So those are the really high level, those are the three things that are the kind of no-nos of, um, of Islamic finance. Uh, oh my God, I have gone on far too long. Uh, so really quickly then, I want to whiz through all of this just to kind of give you a sense of where Islamic finance fits into your life. And I won't go into detail in any of these points but it's to give you, and, and these are points that we've all talked about, you know, we've done videos or podcasts or articles on it, on Islamic Finance Guru. Um, but it's important for you to realize, you know, money is such an integral part of our lives. And Islam, ha that I'm sure you knew, right? Money is an integral part of everyone's life. But Islam has something to say often on most things. And I was talking to my brother-in-law yesterday, he's 40 plus, and, um, he was saying, you know, I worked out my zakat and I gave it. It's very simple. And I said, well, have you, did you work it out on your pension as well? And he said, oh, no, I, I didn't do that. And then he got thinking, he was oh, blimey, there, I'm like 40 plus, I've had a pension for, you know, decades. Now, what, how am I going to work all that out? So this is where, you know, it's good that we're having this conversation now before you guys have a pension, uh, so that you can kind of, you know, have that on your radar. So as a student, you take out a student loan and you know, there's very various different views on that. I can you know, share my view. I have shared it um, <laughs> controversially on uh, on YouTube. Um, and uh, and then you've got internships. Are you allowed to work at um, RBS? Are you allowed to work at Goldman Sachs um, or not? Are you allowed to take money from them if you work there? These are interesting questions that have a bearing on. Uh, whether or not you know you're a good Muslim or not, uh, can you take a grant from uh, Barclays or not? Can you take a grant from the National Lottery? Out of interest, can you? I mean, it, it is logically, it is physically possible to take a grant out. Well, I mean, is it is it halal to take take it out? No, because it's halal. Um, Interesting. So, this room that we're sat in uh, <laughs> is in part from government grants, right? And the government is funded in a large part by debt or from taxes. And taxes are from all sorts of people who have halal or haram money. So, 
I think it's all right. <laughs> that, I think that's the answer. I think it, you, you can take a grant, i.e. something that isn't, there isn't, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, other thing attached to it. You're literally just taking a grant from someone. I think that's fine. Um, and, and that's the same, you know, if it's from a, a, a bank, for example, or from other people. Um, and the, the thinking behind that is that it is literally just a unilateral gift. In Islam, that's how you think about it, it's a unilateral gift. Now, is it better to not take it? Of course, I think it is better uh, from a PR perspective to not take it. So I think we should you know, keep that in mind, but it isn't uh, something that's, you know, quote unquote haram. Uh, and then, you know, what bank do you set up with? So, digital challenger banks versus mainstream banks, versus Islamic banks, if you have a lot of time and um, energy to deal with their customer service. Uh, so those are the three options. I think that you should be going for, potentially at this stage, digital challenger banks, because they don't use that money to do as much haram as the mainstream banks yet, because they're not big enough. Uh, but anyway, that's something to think about. And these are all considerations um, as, you, you know, as you're a student. Then you get into being a junior associate or a junior in uh, some kind of professional sphere. You become, you might become an F1, F2 doctor, uh, working hard um, and saving people's lives and <coughs> not saving people's lives, possibly. Uh, I'm sure, uh, there is a there is a jump in August apparently whenever the new junior doctors join, where you the kind of uh, the the you know, health outcomes of the NHS suddenly go off a cliff. So make of that what you will. Okay, so as a junior, you're now thinking about investment. And as a junior, you've got a little bit of money that you're saving up. You've got the rest of your life ahead of you. You don't have very many cares in the world. You're still going down to the local chicken cottage and uh, you know, eating out there. You're not cooking at home. And uh, you're probably not married yet. Uh, you know, you're not really, you're quite risk friendly, but at the same time, you don't have enough money to really invest in the big ticket things. So like, for example, startups, you're probably looking at at least a 5K starting amount into a startup, but uh, you probably don't have that money yet. So you kind of have to put your money into something like uh, an equity fund. Um, you know, you could do it yourself, you could put it into Wahid or uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne, or you could, uh, you know, use your pension to do it. There's various different ways that you could do it, and you're looking for high growth stuff because you're young and you can take that risk. And you can take, and overall, you'll know it kind of, it'll smooth itself out over the next 20 years or so because you just started out on your journey. Another top tip: you should start investing young, and you should keep investing consistently because really the big returns are um, compounding. Right? Uh, Warren Buffett, rich guy. You know, worth many, many, many billions, tens of billions, the majority of his money, like I think it's 90% of his money, has come about in the last five to 10 years. Like his, his graph is also literally like that. So it's like this, and, and it's compounding. That's the difference, compounding. Because all he does is he sticks his money in and he just sticks at it. Any returns he gets, he reinvests, and he just, uh, you know, it's very boring, but it works. So anyway, top tip for investing there. Um, I won't go into all of this stuff, you know, cars, buying a house, so God, how do you work out that? Then you get into your mid-level, you've started developing a bit of a, a, bit of a belly, uh, you're probably now married, uh, you have a child, uh, you, um, you, know, you are no longer surprised when someone refers to you as an adult. Uh, <laughs> You know, you uh, might have been referred to as uncle by someone who's younger than you. So you know, when you make that level, you know you smashed it. You're now someone who's middle-aged. And at this stage, you're looking at things like life insurance. You're looking at things like making your will because you actually have stuff that you can give away, uh, which you didn't have previously. You want to start consolidating your assets so that really high growth uh, you know, portfolio that you develop initially, you might want to think about you know, tapering that down a bit because uh, you're now probably going to need to put down a deposit for a house very shortly and you'd rather not uh, fritter that all away in something that's really aggressive. So you're thinking about consolidation now, you've got children, uh, pesky little things, 
uh, that you're going to have to think about for the future as well. So that's another variable to add into this calculus of life. Um, and then you probably want to buy a house. Then as you get older, your kids get older, they've got their uni fees. Um, you know, if, if they're bad kids, you might have to bail them out of um, you know, prison or something. Uh, and, but I mean, on, on a serious side, there are always, the more people you have, the more stuff can go wrong. You know, some kid could get develop an illness, uh, you could get cancer, you, anything could go wrong. And so you have to think about the downsides as well. Uh, and so now you're very low risk. You're, you, at this point, you're voting Jerry Corbyn. Uh, you went through kind of Lib Dem phase here. Uh, and now you are firmly you know, pro-Brexit, uh, conservative party, uh, faithful. And, um, and so you're very low risk, right? You, you have assets, you want to keep them, uh, and you don't want to give them away. Um, and then you need to think about your retirement. What you're going to do with your retirement, uh, your, your, your thinking now is you want to fix returns because really there's no, there's no, you know, there's no real uh, you know, purpose to growing your assets further because uh, you, know, you, you have a very pragmatic view of life which is that you're going to die very soon. So um, you, know, you don't want to risk it. So you just want regular returns uh, to go on uh, round the world cruises. And you also want impact, probably at this point, because you want to give back to the community and you want to invest in things that are going to be really valuable and move the needle for the world at large. So it might be looking like charity, it might look like uh, impact investing, it might look like startup investing, it could be all sorts of things, you know, your local masjid, for example. Uh, and all of these things, by the way, all of these decisions that I'm talking about have a basis in Islamic finance. And they will need you to understand the rules around riba, vela, mesir, you know, thinking about injustice and inequality, all of this matters. And there will be things that you do that are um, haram and things that you do that are halal. Uh, and you need to be able to decide between them uh, at each point. So as an example, impact investing, where would you put your money? Let's say you put your money into uh, a venture fund. Well, what are the economics of a venture fund? Uh, does, the, does the venture fund give you a fixed return? Does it have uh, some kind of, it's called a hurdle rate, does it give you uh, the first X percent of that return uh, guaranteed and only then does it have a profit share with a fund manager, right? But that, you know, I, I don't expect you to like really fully grasp what I just said um, because this is what I do as my you know, day job. But the point is that every single one of these things has you know, stuff that uh, you need to be aware of from an Islamic perspective. And then finally, you've got death. Uh, and then, according to most of the schools, uh, you need to pay your zakat that you have due uh, after your death. And uh, according to, I think it's one school, uh, you, um, your zakat, you know, it's kind of, it was due and it hasn't been paid. You should probably still pay it, but it, from a legal perspective, you're sinful, um, and you know you kind of need to still pay it and hope for the best, but um, but it's sort of too late. But the majority of people say that from your estate, you should pay as a god, and then you've got inheritance and how that's distributed uh, from from an Islamic perspective, and there's a particular way of doing that as well. So, Islamic finance is kind of important, and uh, you know, inshallah, this talk will have uh, given you at least. A basic you know flavor of how to make these kind of decisions and if ever you need more uh, information about any of these decisions then there's a fantastic website called islamicfinanceguru.com where we go into all of this and much much more uh, are there any questions okay. ladies first why not Uh, that's quite a broad question. Uh, any any ones that you had in mind in particular? Can you get the internet on here? Yeah. Uh, so 
think of it this way, right? Actually, um, don't worry about it. So, reward and risk. So, down here, you've got zero, well, a little bit of reward and a little bit of risk. So, you're thinking of things like gold or savings accounts where you're going to be making a stupendous 1 or 2 percent, right? And then gold is what it is. And then you've got stuff here, and all of the, I mean, this is obviously, if you put it into NatWest, is that haram or halal? Is it haram because they give you interest money? Yes, a savings account gives you interest, and if it's from NatWest, that is haram. Uh, Al Rayyan Bank. Halal. Halal. Okay. With very, very low rewards. Question mark. No, it is, it is <laughs> halal. But um, there is a question mark about the way, that, you know, the, the structure of all savings accounts in the Western world and generally Islamic finance, full stop. But yeah, but it's halal. Don't worry about that. Um, so then you've got uh, the next step up. A little bit more risk, a little bit more reward. What kind of things are we looking at here? So let's say 5% return. You're probably looking at property. Uh, but the government bonds are not going to be allowed, right? So possibly you're looking at the way that you access government bonds is, so the way, one way, good way of doing it is through a Wahid uh, ultra conservative fund. Uh, so that's where it invests primarily in Sukuf, which is the Sharia compliant equivalent of bonds. A bond is essentially a debt where you are getting a fixed return, um, i.e., let's say, 5 6% a year um, on the back of your money. And at the end of the, the term of the, the loan, you get your entire money back. So essentially, you're loaning money to the government, but it's structured in a Sharia compliant way. So that's uh, typically quite safe. But I would actually say it's slightly more um, riskier than property right now because you'd have to go through Wahid, and Wahid is obviously a portfolio, and a lot of the sukuk these days are corporate sukuk, uh, which are not government sukuk. Government sukuk, government sukuk are uh, safer generally. Government bonds are safer because governments don't go bust. Corporates have a, a penchant for going bust uh, more often. Um, and so for all those reasons, I'd say it's a little bit, little, little bit more expensive. Then you've got things like equity, um, so people like Wahid or, um, you know, you've got uh, Sarwa, you've got um, Coco Invest, you've got Simply Ethical in the UK, you can do your own thing, you've got a whole bunch of pension funds. If you go on the website and you go on Halal Investments, really simple answer is if you go on the website and you go on Halal Investments, it's all listed there, is the really simple answer. Um, but let's carry on this because this is quite fun. Um, and here you've got you've got, has anyone heard of Funding Circle or someone like that? So for, these are um, mainstream companies that are crowdfunding companies where people come on and say, I want some debt, can I have some money to do a project, I'll give you back 8% return. And you do that and you get 8% return back. So they're uh, you know, fairly risky in the sense that they're loans to people but they're not as risky as say possibly startups or equities, possibly not either, because at least there is some kind of asset usually involved and you know, you're, uh, you're entering into a loan transaction as opposed to an equity transaction where your money will rise and fall with the success of the project itself, itself whereas a loan doesn't. A loan you'll get your money back plus a fixed return. So there are now Sharia compliant uh, Islamic, Islamic debt um, investment platforms. These haven't fully launched yet, uh, but we are seeing them coming onto the market as well. And then you've got equities, and then you've got my favorite, which is startup investing, where you can um, lose some money, but also you can make millions. Uh, and so, as Muslims, we're very high risk, high reward. And so this is, this is the archetypal Muslim uh, investment. It's a get-rich-quick investment, uh, but if done if, if done well, it's actually really impactful as well. So there you have it. I think that's kind of you know 
a broad brushstroke of a, you know, the kind of uh, universe of halal investments that you're looking at. And then you've got all sorts of other investments like you've got uh, you know, uh, development notes that come along uh, which are essentially you know, Islamic debt instruments or you might have Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as well. Um, and there's a whole discussion about are they halal or halal. We think they're perfectly fine. But you need to make sure of that because every cryptocurrency has its own uh, nuances and um, you know, its own foibles. So you need to look into that really carefully. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, you could invest in art. We don't help you do that because I'm not really into that. But uh, that's perfectly halal as well, as long as it's not dodgy art, obviously. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. I've not so much put into art. You're into art? Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you invest in the Renaissance art, which depicts something very different, is that, that's wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
I'm aware that this will probably take another entire lecture. Um, well, yeah, we think it's fine. You can look online. We've done detailed reviews and you know, you know, shared our understanding of, of the market and, and what have you. But in a nutshell, yeah, we think it's fine. Uh, we don't think they're perfect. We think that there's things that they can improve on. Um, but inshallah, as more and more people come through us to use Arayan, because ultimately, we're, what are we? We're a price comparison website. More and more people come through us to Arayan or Gatehouse, then we can go to Gatehouse and Arayan and say, look, we reviewed you guys back in the day, um, you know, and we've consistently said these are the issues. Uh, now we have a bit more uh, impact. People are listening to what we're doing and saying, then can you change this, please? So, you know, if you are genuine about changing Islamic mortgages and you're going to go get, get an Islamic mortgage anyway, then, you know, do use us because it helps us actually, you know, fight a good fight. What about non Islamic mortgages? So, uh, there's many schools of thought on that. Um, I mean, if, if you're in dire straits, you can't get an Islamic mortgage, the only thing you can do is get a conventional mortgage and renting is not feasible for you because it's quite expensive, but buying a, more, buying a house on a mortgage will get it cheaper per month and that's better for you. That's quite a complicated you know, thought pattern, uh, fact pattern. In that case, it's probably fine for you to get a conventional mortgage. But my view is that you should try and avoid it as much as you possibly can because, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, many, many bad things about him taking out interest. He, he announces war. Allah and his messenger announce war on the person who takes out interest. Uh, let's go there and then there. Um, you said earlier that you don't feel charity is efficient because most of it goes abroad and instead you kind of feel for the idea of funding startups or like Islamic um, companies. What about the idea of um, kind of funding things but in your own village back home? Would you still have yeah. the same view? Or would you so, so let me be clear, right? I'm not saying that don't give to charity uh, and I'm not saying that you know, charities in the UK are bad or wrong or whatever. Really, that was a way of you know provoking your thought, because I think many people conventionally think that charities are great because it, it's a good thing, right? And uh, it makes you feel good. It makes the person who's getting it feel good. It makes the charity feel good. I mean, what could be wrong with that? But the the point I was making was that it's about impact. It's about actually thinking: is that pound? in five years time going to be more useful uh, going into X thing, which is going to basically wipe out malaria in Africa? Or is it better to treat this person with malaria right now? And I would say that you should be probably investing a, a healthy chunk into the long term because that's where you're really going to move the needle. That is not to say you should do it in the short term. To answer your question, um, yeah, you should you should do that because you, you've got control over that money, but you really should challenge yourself and, and I say this to all of us because giving charity feels nice But the point of charity when it's done sincerely is not about feeling nice. It's not about feeling good about yourself It's not about even making the person feel good about themselves. It's about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and That is what you should be trying to maximize and if you're not maximizing that then you're missing the wood for the trees. Uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. The first uh, is what. Sorry, are not you. Oh, not me. Oh, my, oh, my <laughs> <man>. <laughs> um, what's the difference between um, a halal savings account and a not halal savings account? Uh, so, a not halal savings account, you give money into the savings account, uh, they will uh, use that money either directly or indirectly to do stuff with it that makes them more money, and then they will give you back a cut of that, right? So that's interest, okay? Uh, a, a halal savings account, they will primarily use your money to give out Islamic mortgages, uh, Arayan and Gatehouse, that's, how they, that's their business model. So they will take that money, they will give it into long-term Islamic mortgages, and they will make a profit from it, and then they will give you um, a return um, of that of X percent. Now, the reason why I get, put the question mark there initially was because they they give you an expected profit return, which is kind of fixed at like whatever it is, 2%, uh, 
and they've always given you that and they have a buffer in place to make sure they hit that but in Islam if you're you know, properly get engaging in a mudarab or a musharab or transaction where you're sharing in the risk, which is what you're doing in this case. The the, the Islamic savings account is a, is a sort of partnership, um, but the net result is you're getting a fixed return. That is where the question mark comes up. But given you know the context, given the situation, and given the fact that they don't actually legally say that you are definitely going to get that two percent but you are going to, we expect you to get it, we've always got it, and we've put aside a buffer to make sure that you get it, um, you know, I, I can get comfortable with that. Yeah. So like investing in a fixed rate bond will be, like, will be fine? Why? Because a fixed rate bond, uh, if it's not given by a Sharia compliant provider, is just a savings account, in other words. But it's not similar to like the, like, you're, you're getting expected return and then you're, you're getting a fixed return, and the money that is you're getting back is a is a uh, you're giving money to the bank legally. You're saying, "Here you go, Mr. RBS. Here's a loan for a hundred thousand pounds, and I'm giving it to you on the basis that you give me back three percent per annum." RBS say, "Great, let me have this money. This is now my you know my money that you've loaned me, and I'm going to do stuff with it, and I'm just going to give you that return back uh, as I go along." Whereas in a, a Ryan model, uh, you're saying, Ryan, here's some money, let's go into a bit of a partnership where I'm going to be like the, you know, the silent investor. You do your stuff with the money and I'm happy to take about 2% return. Um, and so then they give you back that 2% return. Do you see the difference? Um, what are the types of startups you can Investing, do they need to, for example, be at a certain stage in their funding to reduce uncertainty? Do they have to have certain debt to equity ratio? Or um, these certain areas that are permissible? And the second question is uh, is it not okay to accept interest if it's tied to the inflation because then just accepting yeah. kind of the, the, yeah. the piece of that as well? So I think I've kind of thought on that view. I think I'm ultimately quite comfortable now with uh, inflation pegged to interest given the context. Uh, previously I wasn't um, because I was you know I just, I just mellowed over the years um, like a fine Jeez. let's see <laughs> 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 um, and what was just, your, your first question of startups so <coughs> I think what you should guys should do is not really worry about investing in startups it's doing your own startups and mm. the reason for that is because there is really, really massive re rewards that you can get. If you're anyway entrepreneurially inclined, that is, by the way. So don't just like go and set up a startup, whereas all you wanted is like just a steady day job. Because if that's what you wanted, then that's not what you're gonna get. Uh, but if you're entrepreneurially inclined, it's definitely worth it. Just that one year after university, you know, you, you're fairly, you know, free still, young. But one year is not gonna make a massive difference. You can come up with a basic idea, uh, you know, maybe raise a bit of money. We help uh, startups raise money. We've raised over two million for seven different startups this year. Um, so if you're serious, we can potentially help you guys out. If you know we like the idea, we'll invest in it ourselves, or we point you in the right direction. Um, that's why I would say, you know, given where you are, rather than investing money, I'd, I'd say invest your own time and actually do your own thing. Now, if you do want to invest in startups, then I think give it a bit of time. Don't do it straight away. Um, and let's say you know once you're uh, you know two three years in, you're earning a decent chunk of money, and you could put, put aside let's say um, you know ten twenty thirty thousand um, pounds, which is let's say just um, ten to twenty percent of your overall port portfolio. When you can start doing that then you slowly build a pot of startups. Because one of the key things with startups is you get back about 50 to 30% uh, tax rebate. So if you invest 30,000 into startups in a year, you'll get back about 15,000 from the government in that year, which is great because it just reduces uh, the amount of investment that you have to make and the risk. So, um, so that's why I would say, I'd say give it a bit of time to actually build up your capital. Don't do it initially because I, I don't think it makes sense for you guys to do that. Um, and only do it with a small chunk of your investment 
um, and um, and then build up a basket of them because most of them are going to fail. But the way that it works, we've done a great podcast on this. I say great because you know I did it, but um, <laughs> it's uh, it is it's quite an interesting one. And we had another one um, with a venture capital fund manager who's an early investor in uh, Deliveroo and um, other companies like Babylon Health, some of the medics will have heard of it. Um, so he's done really well, and he gives his analysis on the economics of venture investing. Uh, and the key thing is there, you're trying to give yourself as many bites of the cherry as possible to pick the next big unicorn, because you don't want to pick someone that's going to create a steady business that makes a three to five times return on your money, because you get uh, you know, 10 companies, not all of them are even going to do that. You only need one dud, and suddenly your return is going to be less than uh, you know two or three times, and that's what you would need as a minimum because that's what you could earn from an equity uh, you know fund over ten years. So, long story short, uh, you want to be investing in big you know unicorn billion dollar potential startups, and you want to give yourself as many bites of the cherry as possible. So you want to have enough money on in your portfolio as twenty percent you know bit of your portfolio to be able to build up that basket where each of those investments is worth two and a half to you know five thousand pounds so that over three to five years you build up a portfolio of 20 or 30 companies um, and that will then mean that you've done two things one is you will probably economically have come out well um, and also really well uh, often and then uh, the other thing is you'll have probably had a lot of impact because startups are focused usually on one thing um, one problem and they're trying to you know, uh, solve that, and they're usually big, you know, difficult problems that the world needs to solve. So that's where the impact side of things would come in. Uh, what do you think about investing in a social trading platform? Social what? Social trading platform such as eToro. Oh, I don't like eToro. I don't like eToro at all um, because they. Uh, they're primarily uh, a forex platform, right, and a uh, derivatives-based platform. Uh, they also offer, now they, they offer like stock market, but you actually buy the underlying asset, so they uh, basically... Uh, they actually offer you an investment into assets now? Uh, yeah, underlying assets, if you buy the stock of the company. So my understanding was that that's not available everywhere in the world with eToro. Um, I mean that if, if that is the case that's fine uh, that particular investment within eToro but the rest of it the large amount of eToro is not fine is it but the CFDs yeah CFDs are not fine and quite frankly these guys uh, the FCA is cracking down on them and other uh, Forex and CFD providers because 80% of people 80% of transactions on them lose money and the people who gain money in those transactions is the forex provider, and what does that sound like? That sounds like very much a gambling company. I mean, the economics are similar. Uh, obviously, that's it is. It's not a gambling company per se. People are transacting and they're trading, and that's where they're losing the money. But these guys, they don't publicize the fact that that's what's going on, uh, and I and I don't like that. And I used to previously work in. We we've advised some of these guys um, from a legal perspective, so you. you Get a better understanding of the market and the you know the underlying tensions there as well. Um, you know the thing the guy in Wolf of Wall Street does. Yeah. Is that Haram? <laughs> what did they do? What did they do? I did. 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 I uh, so you, you, you need to screen stocks to make sure that they're Sharia compliant. Not only from uh, is this you know a company that makes alcohol or not, um, but, but also is this a company that has a level of debt that is acceptable? Uh, is this a company that has um, a level of liquidity that is acceptable? There's a few like, ratios that you need to look at. There's a few apps out there now that kind of do it for you. I think Wahid have have or had a good one might have taken it down, I don't know. Um, we also have a course on it that you can check out. Um, and we also have an article on it that gives you like, the detailed version of, of how to do it. So do you know for someone like getting into investing, um, 
would it be better to invest in like index funds rather than trying to assess like the performances of like individual companies and their stocks and also like trying to verify like whether it's halal or not? Like, wouldn't it just be simpler to go for index funds? If you can find a show you can buy an index fund, then great. Uh, I, I mean, I, my view is that this is cyclical. People say, oh, uh, just do index funds because they perform as well as or better than um, you know, managed funds. This is at the kind of talk of the town these days. But actually, there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a bubble building up in index funds as well. Because if index funds, all they're doing is just tracking the market, and there's no, um, there's no discerning fund managers involved, the less of them, then uh, you, know, you, want, you need there to be a nice mix of the two. Because if there's not that, then all you're doing is just tracking the market. Uh, and you know, suddenly there's no one at the, at the you know, the uh, what do you call it, the till, not the, the wheel. wheel, the wheel. There's no one at the wheel, the tiller. I think it's called the tiller, right? Uh, there's no one at the tiller, uh, and that's not a good thing. So I would say that uh, you know you could go for either, but it's not necessarily you definitely should go for index funds. And then the other thing is that you know finding a halal index fund is quite difficult. I think Wahid might have come out with an ETF in the USA, and uh, they're working on one in the UK. Uh, but you know, failing that, you can always just invest in their portfolio as a whole. Um, you know, one of their portfolios, and that will kind of achieve a similar effect because they've got so many companies in there globally that it's as you know, the, one of the key things you want from an index fund is it's diversified, and that's what you will get from um, a share compliant fund. <coughs> um, often, when it, as especially young students or uh, people who aren't involved in finance, when you look at the world of what we're going to go through, but you mentioned you know, mortgages, uh, insurance, loans, and stuff like that, it can seem like the world's against you in terms of trying to live a, sh like a halal lifestyle. Yeah. And the, there can be a growing propensity just to be like, you know what, everyone's doing it, I'm going to do it as well. Do you have any words of like advice or motivation for us to not go down that route and remain true to what we've been commanded to do? Yeah. Uh, good question. I would say, I mean, to use the example of a medic, right? If you're a medic, hands up how many medics do we have in this room? A lot of them. This is the place to have a heart attack. <laughs> I mean, that's almost giving me a heart attack. <laughs> um, so, if you're a medic, you might think that I am becoming a doctor and that's just a nicer way of me kind of staying away from Haram. I mean, what could go wrong? I mean, I work in, I work as a GP, kids come in with a cough, sort them out, 10 minutes, bish bash bosh. Um, that's halal, right? And I'm not working at, I'm not working in a city where you know you're you're going to be soiled by the dust of interest, and it's going to be very hard to kind of work out a way out. And and so I've avoided that that challenge, and I've taken the easy way out. I kind of know this is not exactly what you asked, um, but you've done that. And my my point is that I don't think that is. Brave. I don't think there is there is moral bravery there uh, in what you've done, because for two reasons. One, you know, you working as a doctor in a GP surgery, or you working as a doctor full stop, comes with its own Islamic moral ethical issues. Right, being a doctor is not straightforward. Organ donation, uh, sexual health. Someone wants an abortion. Uh, someone, you know. You know, whatever. There's lots of issues that come up. You want to, you need to switch off a, a life support machine. Uh, all sorts of things come up, and so, or even like really high level things like the NHS and you know public sector versus private sector, and uh, you know what should I do private sector work if it's going to destroy the end, etc., etc., etc. So there's actually a whole load of ethical issues just within that. But because they're not the, you know, they're not the sexy ethical issues because if you're taking those ethical issues quietly no one's going to be like oh you know he's he's taking some serious ethical he's making some serious ethical decisions there um you feel like that's 
you know, more pious. But if you're working as, um, I don't know, in PwC as an accountant or um, you're working in a corporate law firm, wherever you're working, in an advisory firm, and you're making different sets of decisions around interest, um, I, I feel that that is equally, you know, morally brave. And, you know, the fact that you've gone into it, I think is really, really valuable and needs to be done in order for um, us as a community to progress and for society to progress as well. Because the, the approach that people take is twofold, as this is where it comes into your question. One is, I'm just going to shun myself away from all of this, and that's you know, going into the medicine route uh, because it's pure and you know, safe. Not, I'm not saying medicine is bad, my wife is a doctor, um, that's not necessarily you know, uh, you know, something to condone it for. But um, yeah, you, you might want to take the safe route, but I'm saying that it's not really safe. And then the other option is that you take the, it's all halal, let's just go absolutely mad route, which some first years you might have seen in uh, you know, Muslim first years who kind of, the, the harnesses come off. Uh, you know, they'll go, go on a bit of a bender for the first year. And then some of them will be reined back in second year. Uh, and hopefully you might have some of them in the room right now. Um, and, uh, and so you've got that side as well, who just think everything's halal. But that's not, that's not moral bravery either. That's you avoiding the decision. I think the real place that Muslims should sit is engaging and interacting with the world properly um, and you know, making those moral and ethical decisions as they come. But that shouldn't be taken as you should go and work at an investment bank and take moral and ethical decisions every day because you know, you'll always be making the wrong decision in that situation. Um, what I'm saying is that you, should, uh, you, know, you shouldn't let that um, put you off from you know, going the path slightly less trodden or the one where you think it's spiritually going to, there's going to be tension there. When you're going down this route, you feel like it's going to be hard work. Um, I, still, I still feel you should do that because you know, life is a struggle and uh, you know, you get, you'll get reward for that, uh, inshallah. I think that's where we're going to leave it. It's quite a nice place to end, actually. So, um, obviously, you're going to deserve a head for um, yeah, so it's a massive topic and you did your best to break it down in an hour. So thanks for that. I really enjoyed it, so I hope you guys did too. And um, yeah, obviously if you guys are still interested in having any burning questions, send it to me, share them with Charmin, and we can inshallah pass it on. Um, definitely check out IFG. I really like it, it's something fun as guru. Um, any burning questions are probably answered on that already. And one more thing, if you guys are interested in this kind of thing and you like more topics on it, check out Islamic Finance and Ethics Society. I'm sure you've had me plug it on quite a few events and stick to the desk of it, but do come and check it out if you are interested in this inshallah. Thank you very much for coming.